that was that. And I would say, you know, I bought uh, within the upgrade of the energy management stuff, I bought, you know, all right, I got a Tesla Powerwall, which is a fantastic bit of kit. So that integrates within Home Assistant. So I get to see, you know, all the energy stats and that all feeds into the energy monitoring stuff of Home Assistant as yeah. well. So I, I was going to say, how, how does that, uh, like, how do you find that, like, uh, like the integration with the energy monitoring within Home Assistant and, and bringing it all in for, uh, again, things like your panels, your power wall, because uh, you, you almost have the whole kit there, right? Because a lot of times people have the panel without the power wall or, or things like that. Um, I guess you kind of always have that, but it just might not be connected with, with the battery source kind of thing. But Yeah, it's... It's fantastic first, you know, my commentary is, first of all, it always works. The integration has been rock solid. In the end, you kind of get beyond the, it, you, when you first get it, you're forever looking, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. And I've, I've sort of gone well beyond that now in terms of, I spend more of my time using the information to try and work out more efficient ways of doing stuff. You know, I, I have no control of when the sun comes out, but I do have Absolutely. a bunch of control over what gets turned on and what doesn't. So. Um, as a piece of equipment, if you like, it's really, really well made. It's been rock solid, but it, the, the power wall itself, when you put it in, it has to know as part of its configuration, what you're generating off solar. So it was, it was a huge effort to put the power wall in because I've got to run some cables because I've got two sets of solar and I had to dig up the drive to put cabling in to let it, to actually monitor it. So there was really just like cat, cat five cables, but I had to dig up the drive to put it in. It's the only way it was going to work because the power wall. The, the way the power wall works, they've got a, an, an additive product here uh, called Tesla Energy Plan. Mm -hmm. So I buy at the same price that I sell at. Tesla take control of the power wall. So essentially what's happening is, and you can watch it do it, it gets the forecast in the morning, the solar forecast, which is the same one that we get within Home Assistant if you do that. It works out whether the power wall will charge up with solar and if it won't, so if it knows it's going to be a really dark day, it pre-fills the power wall in the morning with electricity that's cheap off the grid and then it gets to 4 to 7 p.m. and it discharges the power wall uh, and that's I have no cool. control over that. But the difference is if if the house, if I can generate if effectively a net neutral in a year's period, let's say I use 10,000 kilowatt hours and I generate 10,000 kilowatt hours, I have zero bill. So it's, you know, we kind of, as as homeowners and sort of moving forwards, you know, we have a climate crisis. We absolutely have to sort of move towards more of these systems. It just seems frustratingly slow. And, and like my dealings with the grid, 45 working days to get a figure, you know, to actually just be able to put more than four kilowatts on just seems arc arcane really in today's environment. That's how it is. Is that what sort of led you then to... I guess you went sort of went down the energy rabbit hole. Is that how you sort of got onto like your whole central heating and, and wanting to take control of everything like that? Yeah. So, so this was the last bit. Um, so 16, 17 years ago when we moved into the house, I put in a ground source heat pump, which like nobody had ever heard of them mm. at the time. I'd read about them in Sweden and it was just hardly any had been installed. So you basically, I had some land so we could dig up. I, you basically bury 600 meters of sort of quite large pipe work, about a meter underground. And, you know, in terms of trying to get everybody's head around how it works, if you, if you think in the, in the summer, you know, and you open the fridge, it's cold inside. And if you were to put your hand at the back where that sort of ridge of all that sort of radiator thing is with all those pipes, there's heat belting out of the back in the summer. Okay. So it's heat transfer through compressing and expanding, you know, a, a liquid or a gas, which part of the process you're in. And a, and a heat pump is, is just exactly the same in reverse. I'm, I'm sort of changing the cold bit of the fridge to outside where it's extracting heat from, from the ground and it's then putting it in. So I put that in 16 years ago, um, which was just brilliant. So we came off oil and the house runs purely on electricity, you know, for our cooking yeah. and heating. The problem and the main, main problem with it was originally the system was, um, has underfloor heating upstairs and downstairs, which is again, quite rare mm -hmm. for here. But the, the way it worked before was that the system, the boiler was an oil fired boiler and was triggered by, there were, um, thermostats in every single room. So as soon as the thermostat triggered, it would, it would then say, I need heat 
which would then fire the boiler and it would then just start so so if you like all of the um all of the manifolds so there's a manifold upstairs and downstairs where all the pipes go and then and there's roughly say if you like 10 zones so there's 10 ins and 10s outs across this thing and there's a valve on top of each one and by default the way the system was set up was when you put the valve on it shuts the valves or, or rather the electric sort of solenoid if you like so you put those onto the manifold so by default with no power every circuit upstairs and downstairs was shut so as soon as a room called for heat it would fire the boiler and open the valve so that heat was directed to the room now the, the problem with heat pumps is the way they work is they monitor the return particularly the return so it's monitoring the temperature of the return of all of the house it's also monitoring the outside temperature and it's doing what it has as a heat curve so if it sees the like the temperature of the return of the house go down below say 24 or whatever or, or say when it's warm let's say it's what it is today 10 degrees or something you probably find the return figure is something like 24 degrees so if the return of the water coming through the underfloor heating is at 24 when it's say 10 degrees if it drops below 24 turn the heat pump on and if it's cold like if it's minus two outside that figure will be much lower it'll be like 20 or something so the heat pumps in this kind of world of i'm monitoring everything really closely but it's on a kind of 3d mapping of where it's it's not this binary it's 22 degrees yeah. in a room turn it on or off. yeah which meant at the time all i could do was i had to leave i had to take all of the solenoids off and let every single zone just run because the heat pump had to get a signal back to what's happening in the house which on the whole worked but in the, the real problem was to be honest you know like the north side of the house needs more heat than the south side of the house and i had no control over this and it was something that was bugging me for ages and of course home assistant comes to the rescue so i bought a bunch of um thermostats when well, they're not th they're temperature sensors they're they're toya ones i got them off aliexpress or whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and luckily where the thermostats were in each room they'd basically in the house just run some mains cable so i thought i wonder if and i just put a five volt you know standard dc power and it kind of i i send it to every single light downstairs so there's 10 devices or whatever probably eight and it, it powers them up so and then they use wi-fi so i've got like eight or nine upstairs and eight or nine downstairs using Tasmota to actually just continually relay the temperature of each room back and then i spent as we all do i spent hours on aliexpress trying to find the right solenoid because yeah the solenoids that i had when you put them on they close the valve i needed the opposite so you put them on the valve and by default they're open mm. and then when they're energized it closes them. Have I got that right? Yes. Because I was running the other thing backwards. So my heating system now, rather than a room saying, I'm too cold, give me heat. What I did was get home assistant to say, I'm too hot, turn it off. Right. So it then just naturally, so once a room gets to temperature, but this is where you can't do stuff unless you've got access to, to code, if you like, because the heat, what the heat pump must have is a certain amount of feedback to it and it must be able to dissipate its heat so what i couldn't do was turn off every single one because the heat pump will alarm because it says i'm creating heat and i can't get rid of it because i've shut every single zone down so if you look at the the automations for that one in yaml i think it's like it's like 500 lines of yaml yeah. for, for upstairs and for downstairs so I, I have a limit that i can only shut off four rooms upstairs or downstairs so the heat pump always has this ability to dissipate heat. So this winter in particular was the first one where like every room was just perfect. Mm -hmm. I was so pleased because it's cost me a few, you know, solenoids on AliExpress when I finally found the right ones and it worked perfectly. It's absolutely brilliant. That's all powered by Home Assistant. So all powered by Home Assistant. So if, if I took it off now, the house would be, you know, the rooms on the, the, the north side in particular, the house would be colder just because yep. I couldn't find a way to sort of even it out just because of the constraints of the way the heat pump. Right, right. So, and, and if you sort of, Home Assistant, if I take that off, you know, 
although the house would be sort of, and, and I use a lot less energy that way as well, because the heat bump's running far more efficiently. You know, we talked about a, at the beginning how this is where sort of Home Assistant is working out when I have an excess of electricity and doing stuff that I can do. But similarly, it's sitting there going, actually, I'm only going to deliver heat where I need to de to deliver heat within the constraints of what the heat pump can do. Um, and, you know, it's taken a bit of a while. I got it wrong one day when I first did the code. And it's funny, it's like the edge cases, the edge oh, cases the just edge bite cases. you every single yeah. time. I, I just want to, uh, as someone who's been in the industry, I, I one thing I just deeply, deeply hope that Home Assistant gets a load of people into using Home Assistant yeah. who are the ones in those meetings when we're all going, and they're going, why why isn't this working? Why have you missed a deadline? Why why has this IT project not, you know, you know, and you're like, you're going, you just don't understand the complexity. <laughs> you don't understand the edge cases. Yeah, yeah. And I want I want to see their face when they walked into a room or when the light's still on and they can't work out, you know. Yeah. And maybe that would be the point where they kind of go, all oh, right, it's the edge cases that bite you, you know. Yeah. So, some of them, I'm sure we've all been through them. Some of the times when you look at some of the edge cases, and I had one in this instance, the heat pump alarmed, and the heat pump never alarmed. So I was like, oh, cool, done. What have I done? And I'd forgotten an edge case about, I can't even remember what it was, and it had basically shut off every valve. So the heat pump was generating heat, and it couldn't get rid of it. So it just alarms and, and goes off. And that was just, and then you start looking at the code, and you start looking at your logbook, and then you start looking at the temperature valves, and you just go, oh, you idiot. Why <laughs> did you do that? So... So yeah, the the edge cases are just, I, I find them really amusing now, but a point where mine is sort of, you know, bedded down, it's pretty reliable and most people, yeah. you know, so when you do, when I do get an edge case now, I really sort of look at them and go, why, why, why didn't I see that one? Yeah. I'm sure we've all. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 